carry me back to old Virginia. Carry me back to old Virginia. William Berkeley's coming to Virginia affected the colony in a number of ways that we've already discussed on this podcast. His policies did much to lay a foundation upon which the colony could be built. No one would argue against Berkeley's influence in those arenas. But were those the only ways that he affected colonial change in Virginia? I'd be willing to say that perhaps the greatest and arguably the most impactful influence the governor had upon Virginia's history was his encouraging cavalier immigration during the 1640s to 1660s. These immigrants collectively became what we today call the first families of Virginia. They came because Berkeley encouraged cavaliers to come over in large numbers, as historian Philip Bruce noted. They indeed impacted the colony in the ways Berkeley had hoped, with their legacy still being felt today. The families, as historian Louis B. Wright said, The tight little aristocracy that developed in Virginia in the later years of the 17th century quickly gained a power and influence far in excess of the numerical importance of its members, who were vastly outnumbered by the yeoman class. Planter aristocrats ruled Virginia as by prescriptive right, and from the ranks of their descendants came statesmen who helped weld 13 colonies into a nation. With such influence, it's necessary to step back from our chronological narrative and discuss who these powerful families were when they came to Virginia, and how they shaped the growing colony that they came to dominate for about a century. Depending upon which source one consults, there are dozens on the First Families of Virginia, or FFV, list. David Hackett Fisher lists more than 100, while Emery G. Evans focuses on 21. I plan to cover a list that looks more like Evans than Fisher, while adding a few other prominent names not featured on Evans' index. That being said by way of introduction, Let's look at the first prominent family, the Bowlings. We were young beneath the stars, growing love, stealing hearts. Oh, my mama. She disapproved Oh, my father He never knew Cause we've been causing trouble Virginia immigrant Robert Bowling Sr.'s story is a continuation of another family story, a story that reaches much further back in Virginia's annals, that of the Rolfs. In 1615, Pocahontas gave birth to the only child from her marriage to John Rolfe, a son they named Thomas. About a year later, the Rolfs, along with Governor Thomas Dale and a larger entourage, sailed to England to promote Virginia in an effort to raise funds for the flagging Virginia Company. Sadly, As we've already discussed in a previous episode, Thomas's mother, the famous Pocahontas, died in 1617 just after the return trip to Virginia began. In light of Pocahontas's death, John Rolfe didn't want to risk losing his toddler son to illness also, so he made plans to leave Thomas with his uncle, Henry Rolfe, by way of Sir Louis Stuckley. John then continued his voyage back to Virginia, where he married his third wife and lived for another five years, dying sometime in 1622. Young Thomas, who had already lost his mother, never saw his father again. The younger Rolf remained in England and only returned to Virginia after his 21st birthday. Upon his arrival, Thomas was already a substantially landed member of the upper class that could and did claim inheritance from both the English and Powhatan world. In her Virginia Immigrants and Adventurers, 1607-1635, Author Martha McCartney lists Thomas as being one of 40 people transported in the New World by Captain William Pierce, consequently Rolfe's step-grandfather by way of John Rolfe's third marriage to Jane Pierce. Captain Pierce received 2,000 acres of land from the headright system in place, and Thomas was given portions of land based upon his inheritance. 
Included among those lands was Smith's Fort Plantation on the James River's lower south side, in today's Surrey, as well as Verina, about 15 miles southeast of modern Richmond. Within a decade after Thomas's arrival, he was given several hundred acres of tax-exempt land near the Chickahominy River's headwaters at Diaskund Creek, near today's Royal New Kent Golf Club. He received this land in accordance to his manning Fort James with at least six men for three years after the 1644 attack led by his great-uncle, Opecancano. That land was held at least until the 1680s before it was sold to one William Brown. Summarily, Thomas became a prominent landowner in his own right within a few years of his 1635 return. As such, he became a rather prized marriage prospect for other leading Virginia families before Thomas chose to wed Jane Poythress, leading colonial planter Captain Francis Poythress and Mary Frances Sloman's daughter. Together, Thomas and Jane had one daughter, also named Jane in honor of her mother, sometime around 1650. About four years prior to Jane's birth, Robert Bowling was born at All Hollows, Barking Parish, London. Jane and her future husband, Robert, grew up in vastly different geographies. Jane's world was raw, untamed, and often violent. Robert's, on the other hand, was civilized and refined. But they did share one thing in common, as drastically changing upheavals from war and politics affected both children before their initial meeting. Now we're home and moving on Growing up and holding on Oh, my mama Bless her soul Oh, my father Now he knows The Bowling family can trace their lineage at least as far back as the 1300s and possibly further back to the 11th century, as their lands, known as Manor of Bowling, were listed in the Doomsday Book. A William Bowling is listed as owning Bowling Hall in 1316, and the estate remained in Bowling hands until 1649, when the lands passed to the Tempests by way of marriage. Robert's early life appears to have been loosely connected to that Bowling Hall, but we don't know much about his life before 1660, the year in which he came to Virginia. He was only 15 when he arrived in the colony, though Robert quickly solidified himself after he settled onto land near modern Hopewell. Within a few years after his arrival, Bowling purchased Kippax Plantation and made it his home and the center of a rich trade network. Through his local involvement, Bowling would have crossed paths with the Rolfe family, who owned land in nearby Verina. Their acquaintance proved to be worthwhile both financially as well as matrimonially. Soon, Robert asked for Jane Rolfe's hand in marriage, and they wed in 1674. Two years later, a son was born, named John, and according to some, there may have been a daughter, perhaps named Rebecca Jane, depending on how one interprets the scanty records available. Regardless of the accounts, Jane Rolfe Bowling disappears from the records after 1676, most likely from dying in childbirth with John. For his part, Robert didn't remain a widower for long, as was the custom during the 17th century. He married Anne Stiff, herself a widow, in 1681. Anne came from the John Drury Stith line, which further helped to elevate Bowling's colonial status politically. Robert and Anne had nine children together before both she and her husband died in 1709, thus bringing Robert's potential progeny to 11 from two marriages. It's from these 10 or 11 children that the Bowling name really grew, putting it firmly in the first family of Virginia category. For example, John Bowling, grandson of John Rolfe and Pocahontas, married Mary Kennan of Conjurer's Neck, where the old brick house still stands today along the Appomattox River in Colonial Heights. John and Mary had eight children of their own, one of whom, John Jr., married College of William and Mary founder James Blair's niece. That marriage produced nine children, one of whom, John III, married Thomas Jefferson's sister Mary. Another of John and Mary Bowling's children, daughter Jane, married Curl's Neck owner Richard Randolph another leading first family of Virginia member, who could all claim to have descended from Pocahontas. Those six children also married very well, including Richard Randolph II, who married Anne Mead, and had a daughter who married Benjamin Harrison VI, 
honor of Berkeley Plantation, as well as being the son of Benjamin Harrison V, a Declaration of Independence signer. John and Mary's daughter, also named Mary, wed Archibald Carey, who was also from a major Virginia family that owned much land in the colony's interior. For his portion, Archibald owned land along the Willis River in what is now Cumberland and Buckingham counties. He figured prominently enough to have his Buckingham plantation appear on the famous Jefferson Fry map, but we'll have to save a more in-depth look at this major player for another time. Arguably the most notable union from among John and Mary Bowling's children was that of their son John Randolph of Metox to Francis Bland. Francis came from the powerful Bland line that we outlined in a previous episode, which made this quite a distinguished marriage for the time. Their four children went on to do great things, but none of their children had quite the impact as their son John Randolph of Roanoke, who was a leading statesman in Virginia and the United States after the American War for Independence and into the New Republic's formative years. There's no daylight tomorrow to fix all of our problems. Someday we'll just settle down. Oh, brother, no preacher can save us. We need the good Lord to come and change us. Heaven knows we'll not be. Suffice to say for now, as one can see by the few names listed in this very brief genealogy, the Bowling family, arguably the earliest established first family of Virginia, wasted no time laying claim to prominence in the colony during the 17th century. Their noble pedigree reached as far back as the Norman Conquest, and they were exactly the type of family that Governor Sir William Berkeley had in mind when he encouraged sons of the beaten English Cavalier faction to immigrate to Virginia. Within a century, notable figures from the Bowling line married with other first families, who then laid a profound foundation not only for the colony, but also for what would become a new country. Bowling influence didn't end there, in fact. Years after that country's birth, the Bowling line once again added her name to a 20th century American president when Woodrow Wilson married Edith Bowling, daughter of Judge William Holcomb Bowling, whose line traces back to John Rolfe and Pocahontas thus linking one of the modern world's most prominent figures to Virginia's colonial beginning. Though the Bowling Line certainly contains important early Virginia and American figures in her lineage, they weren't the only major family influencing future history. Come back next time as we look at another prominent first family of Virginia, the Lees. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of the Virginia History Podcast. Please help this colony to keep growing. Start by following us on your favorite podcast provider and visit the show notes page for each episode. Those can be found at vahistorypodcast.com. Next, please consider supporting the work financially on Patreon. And perhaps you'd like some podcast merchandise, or maybe a one-time donation fits your budget best. Links for all of these possibilities can be found under the support tab on our podcast website. Other ways that also help out are liking and following us on social media. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash vahispod and follow me on Instagram at Virginia History Podcast to see some of the statewide trips that I take for future episodes. I've also uploaded podcast episodes to YouTube. They can all be accessed by finding my channel at Robert Van Ness. If you haven't already, please leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Doing so increases visibility in the Apple Podcast Network, the largest podcast outlet on the internet. Finally, tune in again next time as we continue our walk through Virginia's history. Do do bad, do 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 do
ಬಾದೇ